let's start. Oh, well, first of all, how did you get into composing? How did I get into yes. composing? How, how, well, as a youngster, what was your musical experiences? Well, I started um, with a very classical training. So I, I learnt at school the piano and then uh, went from there as a Saturday junior to Trinity College, then went to Guildhall and studied um, full-time at Guildhall with Buxton Orr, who was mm. my composition teacher, mm. who was Scottish. Yes. You know? Lovely, lovely man and very, very good composition teacher. And he gave me the skills, because when I started, all I knew was that I wanted to be a composer. I knew that I wanted to write. I had more, I got more pleasure out of coming up with my own tunes and my own melodies and harmonies and shapes, musical shapes, than I did from playing and learning the repertoire. Though I loved um, being a pianist and I still do play um, on sessions and things like that, but I really love the idea of creating something from scratch, coming up with a tune. And he, when I started learning with him, he, he just managed to helped me um, learn about orchestration. He was very pedantic about writing in the score what you want to be performed. And he would say to me that if you write, no, you know, if you just write a series of notes without any phrasing or dynamics and give it to a musician, what you'll get is a bland series of notes performed. Yeah. That's what you'll get. You know, it'll go from A to B and that's that. But what you want is to infuse those series of notes with dynamics and mm. phrasing and accents and give it shape so that the musician looks at it and plays and responds to that and then you get a performance. Mm. And then you can shape that performance. So if ever I took in anything to him for him to look at that didn't have phrasing, didn't have dynamics, it was just as he would get very cross and he would get his red pen out and either strike it out or he'll put his own little dots and dashes yeah. over the top. He was very keen to do that. And so I suppose, you know, the, the art of orchestration, the art of learning how to write for instruments, he would suggest playing a, a scale on every single instrument of the orchestra so that you learn how to write for that instrument. You learn how to write for a flute, how to write for a clarinet, yeah. um, which I did. And he, he understood that, you know, really, when you write for an instrument, you have to write for where it sounds best. Mm -hmm. And he would encourage me not to write something crazy out of register that, that, that nobody's going to be able to play, that's going to struggle, they're going to struggle with, and it's going to sound um, crazy. Write something that works for the instrument primarily. Mm -hmm. Then you could start perhaps experimenting mm -hmm. afterwards. But primary, to, to get your composition skills honed, learn how to write really well for that instrument. So did you then... In, in those early years, have musicians play your pieces so that you could actually digest how they were sounding? Or was this something that you internally felt and you worked with, with your teacher? You, you know what I mean? Because sometimes it's, it's one thing looking at the notation, yes. but not everybody can really sense how those elements come together. No, you're right. And in those days, unlike it is now where you've got samples and keyboards and synthesizers, where now I preview everything and mock up, as they call it, for, for people to hear. When I was starting out, that, that technology didn't really exist. Mm. So I used to play the scores to directors when I was starting out writing for, for films and TV, just at the piano and say, this is where the brass is going to come in, this is where the percussion's going to be, listen to this tune, that's going to be on the strings, and they would have to imagine it, which was almost impossible for somebody who isn't musical. Mm -hmm. I could imagine it in my head, but yes, I did have people play through the scores, mm -hmm. and at Guildhall, certainly, part of the composition course was to have your music performed by the students there. Mm -hmm. And there was a recording studio, and I'd go in and record some of my choral music. In fact, I, you know, they had, it was a great choir there, and I, I did quite a lot of writing for them. And one of the first jobs I got was because on my showreel, which I had sent out to loads and loads of directors and producers when I'd left college, on there was one piece, which was a choral piece, and he was looking for a something choral for his film. And he heard it and invited me in for a meeting and just gave me a chance, and that was how I got my first proper composing yeah. commission. And it's quite, it feels quite a lonely life. You know, I mean, I've worked with so many composers over the years, and, and you know, they all have different ways of working. And I find, as the performer of their pieces, that you really have to go with how the composer functions. You know, you yeah. can't say you must compose like this or like that, or you can't force something. It's quite an interesting kind of dynamic, really. And there is that immense respect, because ultimately, the idea or sound comes from the composer. You yes. know, it can be a collaborative effort, but at the end of the day, it's the composer who has to 
pop those dots on the page, <laughs> you know, for the performer then to create that sound story. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I like writing for a performer that I know, and I know I have written for you. I have the, mm. you know, the great privilege of writing for your 50th birthday and writing that little piece for you. And I, as I was doing it, I imagined you playing it. Uh -huh. And I imagine how you might play it. And I know you're playing very well. And um, obviously know how you um, sound, because I've heard you on various different um, you know, instruments. And so I imagine that. And I do that with most performers. If I'm writing for a flute, I like to know the, the, the flautist that I'm going to use, if possible, so that I can write for them and I know how they're going to sound. And then it does, as you say, become a collaboration. And for me, until a performer takes, takes control of the, the music, and plays, you know, it's just little black dots on a the stave. They, they're meaningless without a performer um, grabbing hold of those notes, making them their own, infusing them with their own personality, mm. giving, it, um, giving it their interpretation. Mm. And it, it's so interesting working with lots of different instrumentalists. As I, I, mean, I have a great, you know, job in that I can go in and I record my music often very quickly after I've written it, certainly for a film. And you... Sometimes you work with lots and lots of different um, woodwind players, brass players, string players. Mm. And it's so interesting how differently they can interpret your mm. music. Um, mm. All great musicians, you know, all right at the top of their game. Mm. But there's a difference in how it ends up sounding depending on the performer. Yes. Do you, are you one of those composers that changes things afterwards? I mean, I remember when the late uh, Christopher Rice, who sadly passed away a few few months ago when he wrote his percussion concerto and he, he gave me the music. We had a few initial meetings and he came to a few concerts in the States and, um, and once we agreed on the idea, um, because it was based on Wagner's ring cycle, so Albrecht, you know, the little yeah. sort of imp as it were where no one knew what happened to him at the end yeah. of the great lock, you know, <laughs> opera cycle. And uh, so he thought, oh, well, I'll pop Albrecht into a percussion concerto, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, at the end, he just basically gave me the music and he said, there you go. And he, he didn't need to, and I didn't want for anything to be changed, but nevertheless, he made it quite clear that that is that. And then other composers, you know, I mean, I've had uh, the likes of Michael Doherty change his whole second movement of his first percussion concerto after the premiere, um, because he, he, you know, felt, oh no, maybe we can try this or try that. And yes. it's really interesting. Yes. I mean, I remember how Michael bought, I think, a pair of bongos or something, and he practically slept with them because he wanted to to know all the ins and outs of bongo playing and <laughs> and so every composer is different yes. you know John Crigliano was he actually changed the title of his percussion concerto and after every performance we gave you know there's always something a, a tiny little detail that he would pick out and, want and would to, artists to, change it well just to, to attend to it and to sometimes change sometimes you know just adapt or Whatever it is, and and was that was that disturbing for you because you would obviously learnt it in a particular way, and then you have to go back and look at that passage yeah. and relearn it. Well, yes and no. I think that it's I quite like the feeling that things don't stand still. I quite like being pushed yeah. as a player. Um, I quite like that period of experimentation when something is so new. You know, well. Unless you try it, you don't know. Um, and I'm also aware that um, in all of those sort of cases with, with Christopher Rice and Michael Doherty and, and John Quigliano, that they all wrote for big percussion setups. Yeah. So it meant that when you were borrowing instruments at different places, you know, you could line up ten tam-tams or gongs or whatever, and they would all be quite different. They would all speak differently. And I think that was more the case with John's piece, you know. So he had worked closely with uh, students at the Juilliard during his writing process. So he got used to the sound of the instruments there. But of course, when you you know, venture into someone else's collection of instruments, they're, they're very different yes. again. Yeah. And interestingly, he flew over from the States and spent a day entirely working on mallet choice. 
so the sticks and mallets that were really? used for his feet. I mean, that's extraordinary. I've never had no, that before. No. So that's how detailed and, and particular. Yes, you know, well, it makes a was. huge difference the type of mallets you play. Absolutely. It and does. you've got a huge range of them, haven't you? Well, and all percussion players do really, or, or you know, most percussion players build up their collection of sticks, and, and that's like an extension of their instruments. Yeah. You know, it really yeah. is. And, 